He was diagnosed with COVID pneumonia. And he is not, he is getting better. He's not doing well. I know I just saw real quick. She posted an update on Facebook and I didn't get a chance to read it. But we need to remember them. Amen. Because when, when, when one of our body is hurting, we need to, we, we, we need to lift them up. Amen. Amen. You know, if, if you stubbed, if you stubbed your toe, or you cut off a finger, or you broke a finger, or an arm, or a leg, you, we, we need to make sure that we see the church body in that same light. Amen? Amen. We need to make sure that we are <clears throat> lifting up in prayer those that are ill, those that are uh, suffering in our body. Amen? Amen. Amen. So... And I know, and I know there are probably many other. I know there are probably many other people suffering and, and dealing with things and going through things and uh, everything that is going on in the world. I am sure that there is many people dealing with many things, and so we just need to make sure that even if you have an unspoken request, we're going to pray this morning. We're going to pray. Is that is that okay? Before, before we get to the word, before we get to what God is doing, if you just have an unspoken request and you have a need in your life that you need God to touch this morning, would you just lift your hand up in the air? If you need God, if you need a touch from God this morning, would you just raise your hand up in the air or you know somebody and we're going to pray. Amen. Now, now this is a pastor's going to pray. We. As the body of Christ, as the body of believers, the Bible says to go boldly before the throne of grace and make your petitions known. So we as a body, as an ecclesia, a legislative government body, are going to come against the attack of the enemy in your life, on the, against the attack of the enemy on the assignment of this church, and against the attack of the enemy on the, uh, the assignment of the enemy on your family. Let me say that again. We're going to come against the assignment of the enemy on this church, on your life, and on your family's life in Jesus' name. And we're going to do it right now. Can somebody say amen? So I, you know what? You don't have to be seated. You can stand up. You can get on your knees. But let's take a minute and let's take the authority that God gave us and let's pray. And let's break some things off. Because I'm telling you what, I'm getting tired of fighting. And I'm getting tired of getting beat down. And I am ready to take some ground. And I am ready to kick the devil out of this church, out of my life, and out of this town. Can somebody say amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you right now. And God, we lift up the Cassidy's to you. God, I rebuke in Jesus' name. I rebuke. COVID pneumonia. I rebuke everything that is going on. I rebuke the attack of the enemy and I say you've got to give it back in Jesus name. Because Lord your word declares that you would give us pressed down, running over shaken. God that there would be nothing Father God that we would not see. There would be nothing that we would not God that you, every twelve God, we just pray right now. God, I hold. Oh, God, I just come against the enemy and I bind you in the name of Jesus. And I command you to leave this service. I command every lying spirit of confusion suffering the body of Christ. And I command you to leave in Jesus' name. I come against the devourer that is coming against your family, that is stealing your resources. I rebuke them in the name of Jesus. I come against COVID and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I declare over you, you are the healed of the Lord. I come against cancer in Jesus' name. And I declare over you, you are the healed of the Lord. By his stripes, you are healed. Not you will be, you are and I declare over you, you are walking it out in Jesus' name. I declare over you right now in Jesus' name, you are the head and you are not the tail. You are above only, you are not beneath. You are the lender, you are not the borrower. Oh, come on, let there be a day in the church where the banks come to the church saying, would you at least take some of our money? In Jesus' name, we declare it. In Jesus' name, we prophesy it. In Jesus' name, we decree and declare I declare right now we are coming after the enemy's territory today oh if you have ever wondered why 
The week has been so hard. Intercessors, if you have wondered why you have walked through absolute hell this week, I'm getting ready to tell you we are going to take territory. There is a reason I wanted the children in here this morning. There is a reason that we are going to, we are going after what the enemy has stolen. We are going after it and we are going to reclaim what the devil has stolen in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're not going to, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of settling, church. Are you tired of settling? I'm tired of settling. I'm tired of, I am tired of saying, well, it's summertime and you know the attendance is low in the summertime because everybody's out. Come on. And then I'm tired of in the wintertime saying, well, you know, it's too cold for them to come out and the weather's too bad and nobody, I'm telling you what, it is not, oh, it is not. Because they, it is too cold and it is not because it is too nice, but it is because they don't want to be in the house of God. And that might be a little bit bold and that might step on somebody's toes, but I am tired. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. Can I just be transparent for a second, church? I am tired of watching people in the church walk in fear. I am tired of people in the church walking in failure. I am tired of seeing my children not wanting to come into the house of God because they haven't had a tangible touch yet. I'm tired and I'm frustrated. Is anybody else with me? Is anybody else tired of coming to the house of God and feeling nothing? Is anybody else tired? Is anybody else ready to stand up on your feet and declare, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in this. And I don't care what I'm walking through. I don't care because Psalm 23 says that I may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil. Because thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Can somebody bless the Lord in this place this morning and say, I may be walking through hell, but I will not fear the attack of the enemy on my life because who my God is for me and if he is for me who can stand against me my God is my he goes before me and he comes after me he is my rear guard and he is my well I don't even remember the word but he is the one that goes before me and he's the one that comes behind that means that no attack can come from the front and nothing's going to sneak up on me is anybody tired of letting having stuff sneak up on you this morning I this is the we all this is different I, I'm just going to be myself for a minute is that alright is that, is that all right if I, if I just if I just preach this thing for a minute because I don't even know where I'm going. I, I know that I, I preached, I, I, I said my sermon title this morning is Everyday Missionary. And we talked last week how every day we are to be missionaries. But how many know that everywhere Paul went when he preached, there was either a riot or a revival and oftentimes both. <laughs> there was a riot or a revival, and there's oftentimes where there was both. Because when God starts moving, so does the enemy. When you start taking ground for God, the enemy starts pushing back because he doesn't want to let his stranglehold go. Have you ever wondered why it feels so hard for you to live a victorious Christian life? Because when you finally stand up, get some Holy Spirit backbone in you, and, the, and, and you say, that's it, I've had enough. Have you ever noticed that's when all your money's gone? Have you ever noticed that that's when the diagnosis comes? Have you ever noticed that that's when your kids leave the air conditioner on 45 degrees in the middle of July and you get the $800 cell phone or you get the $800 electric bill and you're going, oh my God, 
How? Why? Why did you let this happen, God? Because when God starts taking ground, the enemy starts pushing back. But let me tell you what. That devil is a liar. That devil has nothing that he can't do to you because God is with you. Can somebody say amen to that? It doesn't matter what the devil does. It doesn't matter how much he resists. It doesn't matter because on the cross, Jesus declared it in God declared it in Genesis chapter 3 that he said, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. And I am here to tell somebody today that the head of the devil has already been crushed. Oh, come on. I, I, feel, some, I feel some fire in here this morning. The head of everything that you have been dealing with has already been crushed. It's been destroyed. The works of the enemy have already been destroyed. Because if they have not, the cross of Christ was pointless. Oh, that's good. Whoo! So did the cross of Christ do what it was designed to do? Yes. Is there anybody that would say he died needlessly and God was cruel? Absolutely not. So when he died on that cross and fulfilled the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3 that said he will Bruise the heel, but he will crush the head. But then we've got to go and we've got to look at Daniel and you say, well, pastor, why does it take so long? Because we've got to get into some process. That's right. We got to get into some process. Young man, you're going to have to watch. You're going to have to just follow me with that thing. I, I, um, I feel like preaching today and I ain't staying up there. So here you go. Good luck. Those of you watching online, you may hear, but you may not see me because I feel like preaching this thing this morning. I feel like come on down there in here and just talking to you for just a minute. Can I do that for just a second? Can I come on down and talk to you for a second? Because I'm here to tell somebody this morning that we have been living in defeat for far too long. Because every time, everywhere Paul went, guess what, guess what Paul did? He preached the gospel and he proclaimed it boldly. Why do we not proclaim the gospel boldly? Why do we not do what they did? Because I think many of us in this room, myself included from time to time, yeah, that thing froze up, it's fine, have been living under a spirit of fear. We have been living under the fear of man. Because are we going to lose Influence. Are we going to lose the promotion? Are we going to lose friends? Are we going to be all alone in this world? Amen. Are we going to be all alone? Because we live under the fear of men. And we can actually see this borne out in 1 Samuel chapter 15. King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 15. I've got the verse up there. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to tell it to you. And, and, and you're just going to have to flow with me a little bit today. Is that okay? Is that okay? Well, you see, in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel goes to Saul after and gave him some instructions to go into the Amalekite camp and destroy everything. But Saul listened not to the voice of God, but to the voice of everybody around him. He listened to the voice of the people. When the people said, look how good those sheep are. I really wish I had them in my flock. Look how much gold they have. What could I do with that money? And so they convinced Saul. They convinced him that maybe just a little bit's okay. Maybe just a little bit of disobedience. The fear of what man will do to me will 100% always lead me into sin. Are you listening to me, son? Are you listening? The fear of man. 
the fear of what other people are going to say, the fear of gossiping Betty, the fear of man will 100% lead you to destruction. It will 100% lead you to sin. But how many of us, don't raise your hand, you don't need you to raise your hand, but how many of us could self-identify and say, I care what people think about me. I care that if I got out of my pew and started dancing because God delivered me from a homosexual lifestyle or God delivered me from drugs and alcohol. What would people say if I actually got excited and I actually began to believe and I actually began to praise God the way they praised God when God actually moved? You see, our worship is controlled by fear of man. What are they going to say about me? Who gives a flying flip? Who cares what anybody says about you? Because I know what God has said about me. Who cares if they call me a Pentecostal fire freak that is rolling down the altars, a Holy Ghost, Holy Roller? Does anybody, can anybody identify? Does anybody, can, can, who cares what they say about me? Because I know what God has said about me. I know who I am because the great I am tells me who I am. I know I've preached this before, but I am here to tell somebody that we are under the control of the enemy when we are not praising him, when we are not boldly declaring him. And there has been a door opened in your life, opened in my life, that is allowing the enemy not to possess but to oppress. Come on now. Yeah. Come on. You want to know how the enemy gets in? He gets in through one disobedience. He gets in through whispering ears, saying, it's okay. It's okay. One drag won't kill you. One little view won't hook you. One little step won't kill you. You know God loves you. You know God is merciful. Do you know how many times I convinced myself when I was living apart from God that, you know what, it's all good. Because he'll bring me back. He'll love me the way I am. But I'm telling you, I was living under a delusional lie. Yes, God did take me back. Yes, God will take me back. But I am here to tell somebody, you need to get it right. You need to get on the right track right now. Because those whispering ears around you are going to drag you to hell. Because we live in fear. Of what people are going to say about us. So we're not boldly going. Why don't we lay hands on people? Because they're going to think I'm crazy. Why don't. Because you know we got a different language. We're around different people right. Sure. I talk to Howard different than I talk to Crystal. Because I, 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 I talk to Howard. I reach Howard on Howard's level. Hey man, how you doing? Hey bro, what's it? You know, it's, how Howard? It's, 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 he's warming here today. You know, I told I told I can joke around with Howard. I, I, I can reach him on his level. He, I told him he said he brought his coat today. So I see he said so maybe I could sit through your whole sermon. And I said, well, you know, I hope you sit through at least one of my sermons. And I hope the first one you sit through is not your funeral. Right? I mean, at that point, you have a captive audience. He ain't leaving. So if you ain't already there, I'm just saying. Anyways, but I can talk to, I can, I can roll with Howard like that. And I can roll with Crystal like that too a little bit. But how, how many of you know that, like, like we talk to different people and we talk to church, church folk different than we talk to worldly folk. We're a lot more careful, we're a lot more careful about what we say around church folk than we are around Worldly folk. Aren't we? That's right. 
you know, you might you might you might let something slip when you're around non Christian not not Christian people because you know they ain't gonna judge you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me how I know that. Don't ask me how I know that. But what if we actually got real? What, what, you, you know how we get revival? We throw away the pretending mask. We throw away that fear that says, oh, I, what if the pastor knows? Who cares? I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to say, I'm going to, you get in the altar, I'm going to go, praise God, they're in the altars. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to say, oh my God, did you see who was at the altar? Did you, did you see that Wanda went to the altar today? I wonder what's going on in her life. <laughs> but that's the, that's the lie of the enemy that makes us think that's what we do, right? Yeah. That lie of the enemy is, oh, they're going to know I've been in church much longer than this and I should. That's a spirit. That is whispering lies in your ear. That is a spirit. That is where the Bible says take every thought captive. Every thought. So every whisper that comes into my head, this is what I think I say about it. I say that I grab that thing. We have got to start grabbing that thought and taking hold of it and saying, you know what, devil, I don't care what they think about me because guess what? I would rather please God than please man because man might kill my body, but God is in control of my eternal soul. God is in control of my eternal destiny. I am here to tell somebody, I want to liberate you this morning from the fear of what people think. That's right. Fear of man will lead you into sin. Now, let's talk about this next one. The fear of not measuring up. There you go. Come on. Whew. That's a big one, ain't it? Yep. Because how many times do we compare ourselves to where other people are? That's right. Well, how many times do we compare other people to where we're at? Because mm -hmm. how many know it is not wise to judge a three-year-old by the standard of a 16-year-old. Yeah, and it is not wise to judge a 30-year-old with the wisdom of a 90-year-old. Because you see, we all walk through things and we all have a process. And we are all, each and every one of us are at a different journey, a different stage on a process. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, listen, some, some of you, some of what I might say might go flying over your head and you're like, I don't get it. Some of you are going, Pastor, I wish, I wish he'd go deeper. Because we're all at different places. We're all at different levels. But guess what? God's with each and every one of us. So we have this fear of not measuring up. Well, I'm not qualified to serve. I'm not qualified to do this because I'm dealing with X, Y, and Z. Right? Well, that's what we do. That's how we... I, I, can't, I can't do that because... You know, if they, if they get to know me and they find out that, you know, I still cuss every once in a while or I take a drink of alcohol or, you know, I still smoke or I do uh, whatever, then they're going to judge me. I can't sing on the stage because I smoke. Oh, well, who cares? That's between you and God. I'm not here to, I, I am here to tell you what the truth is. I am here to tell you and break down and expound the word of God. I can't change you. But only God can. Amen. Only God can. God can use me. God can use what I say because we believe that's what he does, right? He uses people, flawed people, just like you and me. Because if we all had it all together, then no, we'd be in heaven, right? 
If we all had it all together and never did anything wrong, never sinned, never did anything wrong, I think we would just, you know, be able to just transition right up into heaven. Because the apostle Paul even said he struggled with issues. He said, I've got a thorn in my flesh and I begged God three times to take it away and he wouldn't do it. But yet we look at these things as punishment. When they're not punishment, but they're God walking us through it. But you see, we have this fear of not measuring up. Now I want to read a scripture to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Now this is, this, this is a real life-giving, affirming verse here, okay? Now you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. I love the way I think it's the message version says it. He says, y'all, and basically he's saying here, all y'all are a motley crew. Yet God still called you. God didn't call you to be, the, he didn't call the best of the best. He didn't call the Bill Gates of the world. He didn't call, I mean, he would. He didn't call the presidents. He didn't call, he, he called us. Not many wise according to the flesh. Not many strong according to the flesh. Not many people that people would look at and say, oh, wow, they must be a man of gold. He didn't call, I mean, he did, but that's all Paul's talking about. He, he's talking about, he says, listen, God has chosen the foolish things. Like I said, real life-giving verse, you're a foolish thing. God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are, despi which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So do you want to know why you haven't got it all figured out yet? Because you're still flesh and bone. And he will not let flesh glory in his presence. Because you see, there's a weight of glory that is to come that no flesh can stand in. That's right. There is a presence where when God shows up, we go, whoa! People of unclean lips, I am not here, I am not. You see, there's a place where God shows up where he takes each and every one of us in our weakness and our frailty in our ability in our in, he uses us in our inabilities I can't do it yes you can you're right well let me rephrase that you're right you can't do it God in me right. will do it. There you go. Right. So when we say, and we would, if we were to come and we were to lay hands on people, we feel unqualified to lay hands, right? Mm -hmm. But what if I laid hands on and I, in faith, knew that it's not me it's God in me, working through me to do his will and his good pleasure. What if I begin to realize that the revival we're waiting on is here, but he's waiting for us to step up into it. Who I'm here to tell you the revival we've been praying for, believing for, is here. 
And God is waiting on you and me to step up into what he's called us to. That's right. And the thing that we oftentimes want to do is because we don't feel qualified and we feel like others are going to judge us for what God is for what God has called us into. I have never seen anybody judge a two-year-old for stumbling when they walk. And we have got to get to the place where we don't judge somebody for stumbling in their ministry. Because the Bible says, Yea, the righteous man falls seven times. Yet, he gets back up. So, a righteous man may still fall. The Bible says that Abraham was righteous. Yet how many times did God have to bring the rod of correction and get him back on course? Elijah, the man who called down fire from heaven on an altar. Yet God still had to correct his course and bring him back. Simon Peter. Who in one instance said, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Short time later, denies that he even knew Christ. Yet God. Restored him back. Because when Jesus arose, he arose and he said, Go tell the disciples and Peter. He called him by name. Do you want to know why God called Peter by name? God called Peter by name for one reason. Because in that day, in that culture, if you ever denied your rabbi, you were rejected you were lost and you were worse than scum because you denied your teacher so he was no longer by anybody considered a disciple yet God in his infinite wisdom and mercy said go get the disciples and Peter so why do we so often think that because we make one mistake, because we step out of line just a little bit, that God won't bring us right back? Why do we sit and, because you see, that's what David, God called David a man after his own heart. Not because he was perfect. Because every time his sin was exposed, he repented. So do you know what we need to have? Instead of a fear of what people are going to think, is we need to have a repentant heart. That's right. We need to have a heart. Because in God's sight, He has called us. And we measure up to Him. Because He's the one that gets to do the measuring. Amen? And the last one I want to talk about. The fear of failure. Because what if I step out into that business idea that God has called for me? What is going to happen if I lay my hands on them? And they don't get better. What is going to happen if I stand up here and I declare you're the healed of the Lord? Get up and walk. And they don't get up and walk. You see, there's a fear of failure plaguing the body. What if I get in the class and I realize I'm not a good teacher? 
<laughs> what if pastor throws me on Wednesday nights and for the next year I get to teach every Wednesday night save a couple and nobody likes me nobody responds to the word what if you're like me and you started a church in New York with three people and you left the church with two people <laughs> there's a fear of failure that must be broken so that we are able to function as the body. That's right. Because I want to tell you this, Isaiah 41 and 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So when God says, step out, we go, what's there? I used to use this example all the time. I'm going to do it again. It freaked my wife right out. Really, certainly her and Chris always tell me when I get up here on the edge, they're just waiting on me to fall off. When God calls me to step out, when God calls me to step out, in faith, he calls me to keep my eyes on him and take the step. Because oftentimes when we take the step of faith, doesn't it look like we're going to fall? True. Because if anybody else is like me, when I take the step of faith, I get what if. What if? Let's say it. Give you a practical real life example. When I said a month and a half ago, we're believing God that He is gonna that He is going to pay off our debt in this church, twenty-five thousand dollars of it by the end of the year. And I'm going, what if he doesn't? I'm going, you're gonna look pretty foolish if, if he doesn't. Right? But we take that step of faith. Anyways, because he is faithful. That's right. He said that he would uphold me. If I truly believe it is his word, then he has a responsibility to uphold his word. Right? It's his job. It's not my job. So if I lay hands on them and they don't recover... That's not on me. Now, I may need to adjust some things in my life. I may need to self-reflect a little bit, right? But if God has called us to do it and we step out and do it, his word says that he will deliver. Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12 says this. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. And the Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. God is watching to see his word be fulfilled yeah. in your life, in your family, in this city, in this state, in this nation and in the cosmos. God is looking over his word to perform it. So when I say revival is here, yet we have to be ready to step up into it. I believe wholeheartedly the first step that we as a body have to take is to break the stranglehold of fear. That's right. Because who cares 
if anybody thinks you're weird in your worship. Let me tell you what I would love to. I would love to see. I'd love to see somebody with flags. I love flags. Now, I mean, don't poke anybody's eye out, but you know what I mean. Like I love flags. That is some amazing stuff. That is some amazing stuff. Is there anybody that has wanted to do that? Me, I'm not going to have to ask it, but you see what, but, but, but it's different. It's not something normal. I wish, I believe, one day I am going to have a Hammond B3 organ and have somebody to play it. <laughs> Is that normal? No, but I want one. Why? Because we can't be afraid to be different. Right. Why did I, listen, I, today's worship music style May not have been your thing. It may be a little bit more rock and roll than we normally do. Okay, a little bit, I understand that. But if we're not afraid to be who we are, and not afraid to be different, not afraid to be who God has made us to be, what could we actually become if we weren't actually afraid to break the bank and give everything in, the, in our savings account to the church? I mean, I'm not telling anybody to do that. That's not a word. But I'm just saying, what, what if we became radically generous? Because we didn't have the fear controlling our lives to say, well, how am I going to survive? It's not your job to survive. It's God's job to provide for you if we believe the Bible. What if? What could we do if we were not, if we did not allow the spirit of fear and the access. But we may also have riots. We may also have people who are on our way. Everywhere that's in revival has every, every preacher that they have ever had is called a false teacher because we believe that God actually will show up and do things today. So just, just you, you hear it, I'm a false teacher. If you, you, I mean, I'm not really, but there are people that would think that I'm a false teacher because that's just because I actually believe that God's going to show up. I'm going to lay hands on you and I'm going to believe that. But we've got to get to the place where the fear of man doesn't stop what we believe God has called us to do. So, so, so when we see the vision of Hey, let's put teams together and actually go out into the city and compel them to come in. We actually have people that volunteer to do it. That's not just the pastor and sister Sarah trying to get people to come to church because we don't care anymore what they think because we're trying to get them to salvation. What would your life look like if you didn't have fear controlled? That's right. What would your life look like if there was no fear? If you would, let's stand. I'm going to open these altars. And if you need a touch from God, I want you to come to these altars. And I believe, that, I believe in faith that God is going to meet you at these altars this morning. If you need a touch from God, I just, I'm not, I don't want to give a specific altar call. I'd st every evangelistic training thing in me is going haywire right now because I need to give you something to get you to the front. But if you just want to touch, if you just want to touch, if you just, God's here. God's here. I'm going to begin to pray. And if you want a fresh touch from God, I want you to come down here. And I just want you to believe in faith. That God is going to break fear off your life. That is what we're going to believe. That is what I am going to declare in Jesus' name right now. That he is breaking fear. Mamas, bring your kids. Grab them. I mean, grab your grandkids. Grab somebody and get them up here. Let's believe. Grab somebody and bring them to the altar with you this morning. And let's believe that God is going to do something in this place that he has never done before in this place. Come on, somebody. God, we just come before you right now, God, and we just declare. 
over this house. We declare over this city, God, that you are breaking the spirit of fear off of each and every person in this house. God, we just declare right now, God, that you are breaking fear off in Jesus' name. I, God, I, I come against every spirit of fear. I come against every spirit because it is a spirit, church. Come on, stop praying with me, somebody. Come on, start declaring with me, somebody, that fear is, oh, God, we just declare fear in Jesus' name is being broken off. Fear in Jesus' name is being broken off. God, we just declare it right now.